Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be a part of this panel. Um, and as you can sort of intuit from uh, what Addy's just said and the, the title of my talk, um, what I'm gonna be talking about is um, very much a reflection on the research that I um, uh, am doing right now around boredom and networked media. Um, it just as a sort of um, uh, spoiler, like it does take me a little while to get to uh, the bit uh, in the main title. So the ethics bit, but I promise I will get there. So uh, bear with me. Um, so boredom, so I've been working on boredom in the context of networked media. Um, boredom interests me particularly in uh, this context because of the tensions that accrue between digital network cultures demand for entertaining content and perpetually entertained subjects on the one hand and the state of stuckness, hesitation, affective flatness or stalled agency that boredom indexes on the other. So in my book, I traced how these tensions are navigated through the task of boredom management uh, that is delegated to um, uh, media users who are framed uh, as being responsible for the perpetual monitoring and modulating of their own affective experience as it unfolds in, in real time. Um, as part of this, I also think about the very specific ways in which boredom is actively targeted within, <clears throat> excuse me, within the attention economy of networked media through technologies that promise to visualize, sense, predict, and even uh, preempt our emotions. Um, so in this talk today, as I said, I, I'll, I wanna reflect on a few of the ethical issues that accrue around this framing of boredom as firstly a problem that subjects need to manage and secondly, as something that can be visualized and detected through bodily gestures, um, movements and facial expressions. So um, what does it mean, for example, um, for, that, um, for us to outsource our emotions to machines, for example, when we harvest emotion and reaction gifs or emoticons um, and weave them into our communicative exchanges. Um, companies where I um, grabbed this, uh, these series of gifs from Giphy, um, which was purchased by Facebook for 400,000, uh, sorry, $400 million in May um, 2020 compile databases of GIFs that are classified according to discrete categories, for example, mood GIFs or reaction GIFs um, that offer a, stack, a stock repertoire of facial expressions um, and uh, sort of gestures and bodily poses um, that make up discrete emotions that users are invited to feel through um, in their communicative uh, exchanges online. So boredom themed, um, more specifically, these boredom themed uh, reaction GIFs are often used um, uh, to comment on a particular situation within a communicative, a communicative um, sort of online context um, as boring and almost always with the intention of moving the conversation along and preventing further boredom, right? So, um, uh, and then uh, what do we make of the promise uh, that digital media technologies can not only visualize, uh, but also sense, predict, and even preempt our emotions uh, before humans can. So for one example, um, in emotional AI applications like this one um, that is based on a research project in um, Shenzhen, China, um, where uh, boredom, where facial recognition technologies are used to detect boredom in classroom settings uh, with the aim um, of uh, allowing the lecturer to know if a student is bored, right, because you can't really tell with your own eyes, um, and be able to shift their approach to, quote, make education more entertaining. Um, and uh, these technologies are modeled on the um, facial action coding system, or FACS, um, that's widely used by uh, uh, affective AI companies such as Affectiva or Noldis, where these um, examples below come from. Um, which are attempting to map the facial expressions that go along with boredom. Um, so you can see in this example, these technologies um, are then sold to potential clients for potential applications um, uh, on the tacit assumption that boredom is inherently unproductive um, and needs to be carefully managed uh, and contained by, you know, by machines. Um, and indeed that it can be managed and contained. 
So my research asks, what, asks what's at stake in the way that digital media platforms frame human affect in this way as legible and useful, as something that can be read or detected from the, from the outside signs uh, written on the body and then made available as information or data for others to use. Um, and I'll just show these in the background. I'm showing them without sound, which really does detract from their impact quite a bit, but um, for sake of time. Um, for me, there are also important ethical issues that pertain to how people are often encouraged to perform even the most banal moments of their daily lives and make them available for specific use across digital networks. And these, I should have said, are all vines that use boredom related hashtags to describe what was in the um, video as being um, springing from boredom or like a comment on boredom in some way. Um, and indeed my research um, uh, sort of draws from this approach of tracing the use of boredom themed hashtags, captions and other descriptors across user generated platforms, including YouTube, Vine and TikTok to ask what kind of content people are creating to describe a particular situation or experience as boring or containing boredom in some way. And also to ask what sorts of evaluations are being made about what counts as meaningful or productive um, uh, in this process. Um, and as I um, said before, I look in particular at the specific gestures, habits, and embodied practices that have converged and sort of settled around boredom and the experience, um, the physical experience of being bored in a digital network culture. And that includes obviously not just the um, gestures that we're seeing in the videos, but the gestures that are used in or, you know, um, that, that have become ingrained in um, our communicative practices. So things like swiping and um, refreshing and um, uh, scrolling and things like that. Um, to consider how this highly ambivalent emotion has been instrumentalized as an important site of discipline and power and sort of, you know, impressed upon the body. What fascinates me is the success um, is that the success of platforms like TikTok, Vine, and others has relied in part on the way um, that the privileged, uh, sorry, on the privileged relationship that they managed to establish with the mundane, with the mundane, and ordinary, and with ordinary life. Um, as one Vine scholar notes, part of the now defunct platform's allure was it, its obsession with human facial expression, gesture, and movements. And its ability to picture, um, you know, people simply doing things. Um, and in the wake of Vine, um, TikTok has taken up this. Uh -oh, I'm getting the spinny wheel of death. Um, hopefully that will move forward. But um, TikTok has taken up this remit of providing um, access onto the ordinary lives of everyday users structuring both users and viewers um, into a shared temporalized experience of this lived every day. Um, now, I'm just gonna keep talking and if we get the, if we get the TikToks fine, if not, um, I was hoping to show some of the um, board in the house uh, meme uh, based uh, TikToks that came out in the context of the lockdown. Um, uh, and yeah, so this, um, this sort of, um, uh, effort to sort of provide an access onto a shared kind of like collective every day has been especially urgent in the context of the COVID-19 lockdowns, um, perhaps because the allure of social media platforms like TikTok are based on providing access to the ordinary lives of its community of users, it's been able to structure a relationship to the pandemic around a promise of fostering new public intimacies and new social solidarities around collective experiences of being bored in the house. Um, as one TikToker, and again, I would uh, show a slider if I could, but um, as one TikToker, Lydia Keating puts it, where Instagram idealizes excess, and this is, um, you know, a two camera sort of, um, you know, um, monologue that this TikToker gives to, to explain how she sees TikTok. Um, where, where Instagram idealizes excess, TikTok encourages us to, to embrace and romanticize the mundane aspects of everyday life that usually go unacknowledged on these platforms. Keating goes on to describe TikTok's fascination with um, what she calls beautiful montages of boring everyday life. And that's what life is, she says, boring tasks punctuated by moments of excitement. This is a very performative um, speech um, she gives. Okay, uh, so, so then part of what makes user-generated short form video sharing platforms like TikTok and Vine fascinating is their ability to visualize the everyday and to charge it with affective intensity. 
to make boredom eventful by filling up dead time and weaving it into the rhythms um, of networked participation. This is part of their allure for social media users and for me as a social media researcher, the way that they're bound up in and help to produce the textures and rhythms of the ordinary, even while they strive to make the ordinary spectacular, eventful and exciting. So while platforms like TikTok have the potential to produce new intimacies around a kind of public boredom experienced en masse during lockdown, they do so through a mimetic logic that patterns and classifies human behavior, often along highly prescriptive formulas and norms. Any given singular experience of being bored in the house uh, is choreographed and settles into a viral patterning of gesture and bodily movements that can then be put to work um, as a productive force across uh, different media streams. And uh, my research in general suggests that um, there's good reason why we should be wary about this drive to classify, name, fix, and fix the meaning of human emotions, because doing so performs a kind of violence um, to the concrete situatedness and the lived ambiguities of human experience, abstracting them as data and thus making them replicable, scalable, and search searchable. Uh, as my co-panelists, Katrine, um, and other media scholars have pointed out, the social media affordances of persistence, replicability, scalability, and searchability call for a shift in the way that we think about ethics and ethical methodologies in this field. Um, in, in his work on distributed selfhood, um, Vincent Miller uh, writes uh, that issues around privacy and autonomy are not only legal or technical problems, but primarily problems of ethics that are related to the presence. He argues that when treated as abstract data, personal information about the self, and here I think he is talking about a selfie which was um, scraped um, and used um, to advertise um, something really generic in a dating company, but then it was, um, uh, it transpired that the selfie of the, it was of a dead woman that somebody sort of um, uh, came across. Um, so he argues that when treated as abstract data, personal information about the self is easily divorced from the person, and that this results in a kind of what he calls a kind of ethical weightlessness um, that's problematic. He suggests that in this context, it's important to consider not only privacy and rights um, to a private life, but more fundamentally what it means to be human in a post-digital era. Miller calls for an understanding of ethics that moves away from a representational culture, um, a culture in which data is abstracted and stands in for a person um, and towards a presence culture in which data and bodies are framed as having the same ontological and ethical weight as being part of the same material substance. Um, now, I agree with um, Miller in principle, but this idea um, is really thorny and troublesome when it comes to um, thinking about how to pra practically apply it. And I'll come back to this in, in a minute. So this, thus far I've been discussing how boredom theme posts on social media platforms participate in a kind of biopolitical drive to visualize affect so that it can be put to work on behalf of social media corporations. Many of the posts that I analyzed um, use the affordances of platforms um, in order to manage and dispel an experience of boredom before it can truly take root, before it can kind of slow down um, the, the sort of networked um, rhythms. That, that it is participating in. And certainly before, um, you know, before a, a viewer can sort of get, get too bored to, to watch. Um, they tend towards the hyper-performative, reckless or zany in their quest to swiftly move um, past an experience of boredom. But my work also considers how these affordances can be used differently. Um, okay, so um, I was gonna show a few other uh, vines. Suffice it to say, um, they're very different. And what you see in them, a lot of them is, um, you know, like people kind of like um, just chomping their teeth, people kind of like bashing their heads repeatedly into pillows. Um, there's a lot of kind of like inarticulate noise happening, um, uh, but um, uh, they, um, are more concerned with showing kind of like what boredom does on the body, like the boredom's effects on the body. So um, these posts put emphasis on a temporalized experience of boredom more than they do on driving it away and thus make a kind of trouble for social media cultures, fantasies of 24 seven sort of, you know, relentless entertainment um, and intensity. These kind of posts fu function as moments uh, um, of intimate self-exposure or disclosure 
through which an individual sounds out the contours and rhythms of lived experience without shaping it into a coherent statement about boredom um, and without transforming it into some kind of entertaining micro event that can be spread easily through social networks. Um, and it's important to note that the loop counts on all of those latter videos are extremely small most, most, most of the time in the single di digits. And this is um, in contrast to the, the other ones which are you know, um, widely shared. Um, whereas the earlier examples I discussed emphasized the more public nature of boredom as a social category, showing how it should be managed and modulated, these disclose something much more ambiguous, tentative, and seemingly more private. In these that you haven't seen, um, whatever is at stake in boredom is more difficult to fully access or read, um, and thus they require a kind of labor that returns us to the body and its potential for, communica for, for communicability, but without fully codifying what that sort of body's meaning is. In Vincent Miller's terms, these posts might make trouble for our, our ability to separate content from form or the concept of boredom from a temporalized embodied experience of living through it, enduring it. It isn't that these bodies are somehow immune from the processes of abstraction at play in the other examples I've considered, but that they produce a different kind of attention to the lived ambiguities of boredom in the networked present. Um, so this made me start to think about what it means for me as a researcher um, to speak on behalf of these bored bodies, given boredom's con constitutive opacity, its tendency to want to suspend or refuse meaning. How can researchers pay attention to the fullness of boredom without reinscribing the violent logics of classification that are at play in the media that we're analyzing? Um, so I'll just summarize this last bit quickly because um, you're not gonna be able to see my slides. <laughs> um, and I know I'm sort of running up to time. Um, just to say that my entry point into thinking about these thorny questions is informed um, uh, largely by phenomenological um, uh, perspectives, which emphasize the messy ambiguities of human affective experience and concentrate on the concrete kind of materiality of the human body, um, even as it's distributed through visual um, networks. So I agree with Miller's suggestion that in order to address the thorny ethical problems that accrue in a digital network culture, we need to reflect further on the nature of what it means to be human uh, and, envelop, and develop ethical strategies that are capable of grasping the tensions and contradictions that abound in this context. Um, so in thinking about how I myself coded the Vine videos that I harvested and categorized for the project, um, what interested me about the ones that you didn't see <laughs> um, is that they um, is not that they provided a somehow less mediated access onto the lived affective pressures of being bored, but because their emphasis on incoherent noise making produced a different kind of attention in me, uh, one that might be centered on what um, Lisbeth Lipari calls um, thinking listening as a way of being, um, and that that is the title of her book, Listening, Thinking, Being, Towards an Ethics of Attunement. Um, and I think this has overlaps with what um, Katrine was um, talking about when she was talking about um, the sort of modes of empathy that are embedded within an ethics of care. Um, and she frames listening as both an ethical relation and a way of being in the world, which um, foregrounds the body and its materiality and the temporal dimensions of listening. Um, and I guess just to... Um, um, yeah, just to jump forward to the last thought here, um, boredom theme posts um, uh, on social media are often framed precisely as a kind of address to an other. The phrase I'm bored is often used as a kind of shorthand way of calling out for some kind of response. It's an opening onto a desire for a new relation to the world, which is blocked or suspended, but also created through boredom. If boredom themed posts are, are essentially about the possibility of new desires and new, new ways of being in and relating to the world, then they carry a kind of ethical weight. However, this ethical weight isn't always easily recognized within communicative exchanges on social media platforms because of the way that these prioritize performative gestures and embodied practices that are read, readily identifiable, easily classified, and which can be scaled, appropriated, and spread. Um, and just to conclude, and again, I know this is like crunching like a whole lot into um, nothing, but um, 
uh, I wanted to return to the question of um, what this means for me and my research on boredom and social media. So if boredom has the potential to disclose what's most human about human beings and therefore create a demand for new types of relations and new intimacies to, to um, be possible, then what's needed in this context is a form of ethical attunement um, that can recognize it as such. Um, and while this, this sort of ethical attunement came easily to me in uh, the more sort of recessive um, and less performative posts, I guess the ch thinking about this now, the challenge for me as a researcher of boredom is to develop a means of attending to this ethical dimension across all the posts that I co collected and coded, um, especially the ones that have um, uh, seemed to operate more fully within the terms of the scripted kind of performative norms. So I guess my concluding question, um, would be how do we develop these methods of um, kind of attending to um, the textures of the, the ordinary um, and sort of getting beneath the um, uh, ingrained gestures and embodied habits that seek to instrumentalize boredom to, to sort of um, uh, yeah, situ situate that um, and recognize that more.